is Marcus Maloney, the Equity King from Yes I Buy Houses and the Equity Real Estate Blog.com. Um, I'm here giving a video on today in regards to the wholesale contract. I had quite a few questions asked of me uh, the difference between the wholesale contract, the assignment agreement, and what needs to be in the wholesale contract. Uh, when I first got started out, um, I wasn't a realtor at the time. And I didn't have contracts and things of that nature. So I went to the internet just like most of everyone else do. Go to the internet, download a contract and try and use that. Well, uh, that's not a bad idea. But at the same time, you need to make sure you have your attorney, a uh, real estate attorney in your area. Make sure they review that contract. That way they can add in any content or take any content out. But just for the, basi uh, the basics uh, of this video i want to go over some of the things that you need to have in your uh, wholesale contract in order to make sure it is a legally binding agreement so let's dive right in and kind of go over some of the things that need to be in the contract some of it may seem to be elementary but believe me i have it up here for a reason um i've been doing this for some time now and i definitely understand that if you miss one or two pieces of this, your contract can be voidable. So let's make sure uh, we have all of these items and articles on your real estate contract. So first, uh, we want to make sure we have the date. Uh, you want to make sure you have that, that date on the contract. You can have the date listed you know, at the signature line, but again, it's good for the attorney or the closing agent to see that date when that contract was instituted or agreed upon. So for this video, let's just use January 2nd, 2016. This date is going to be reflected a little bit later in this video. That way you'll see how this date comes into play. Uh, so first, you need to make sure you have the date on your contract. Uh, secondly, the seller's name. Again, this may seem elementary, but uh, it's been plenty of times where I've seen people, and I've done it myself, had the wrong name on the contract. And you may ask, okay, well, how does that happen? Well, if you do direct mail marketing or if you do internet marketing, any kind of marketing, you'll have people give you a call. So they give you a call. I heard from you know other wholesalers. I had people that they had people that tried to wholesale them an apartment an apartment complex that they didn't own or an apartment unit they didn't own. So one thing I always tell people is once you get the address, go to your tax records. Um, here is Maricopa County uh, Assessors. Go to the, your assessor's office, pull the name that's associated with that property and that is the name that needs to be on the contract. So. For example, if you get a call from Joe Blow and he wants to write a contract and he wants to sell his property, but the property on a tax record is in uh, Joe Blow um, LLC, then that name on that contract needs to be Joe Blow LLC and not just Joe Blow. So remember, if it's an LLC, a trust or anything like that, the name that needs to be on the contract needs to be the name that's reflected in the assessor's um, records. Uh, next, buyer's name. You need to have your name, the buying entity. If it's, um, again, same thing. If it's your name, then you need to put your name. If it's your buying LLC, you need to have your buying LLC's name. Also, another important key factor you need to have with your name, if you're planning on assigning or wholesaling this contract, you need to have this verbiage here. And or assignee. This gives you the authority to assign this contract. Uh, I've seen it where a person had the property under contract and their buy name didn't have an or signee and they couldn't assign that contract. So you need to make sure you have this verbiage and or assignee. So buyer's name, uh, for example, equity, real estate, investing, 
slash and or assignee. Um, there's another place you could put this and or assignee. Also, um, it can go in the additional terms and conditions and we will get to that. But you need to make sure you have this on your contract. When you talk to your closing attorney, when you talk to your escrow officer, they will ask if this verbiage is on your contract. So make sure you have this on there and or assignee. So in essence, the buyer can buy this property or and or someone he's assigns the contract to can buy the property. So remember, and or assignee, very, very, very important. So let's put a star right there on that. Uh, next is the property address and PIN number. Uh, the property address. What are you purchasing? Where is it located? You know, 123 Main Street needs to be on that contract. And not only do you need to have the physical address, you need to have the personal identification number. That's the PIN. The county um, is going to look for this PIN number. The reason why they look for the PIN number is because there's new subdivisions being built, there's new territory being built, and it happens where there's two homes in the same county that has the exact same address. So it'll be 123 East Main Street, blah, 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 blah. And then another property will be 123 Main Street, so on and so forth. So this property identification number is what identifies this specific property. So this, you can add the legal address, um, but as long as you have this property identification number, that's important. Where can you find this property identification number? When you go to the county assessor's website and put the search in for that property, and when you're looking for this seller's name, this PIN number will be there as well. So you need to make sure you have this property identification number on there. Um, also, the purchase price needs to be added to the contract. I know that seems a little bit elementary, but it's important that you know how much you're buying the property for, the seller know how much he's selling the property for, and the title company is aware of how much the property is being sold for. So if it's $100,000, I put the 1000000 and I put one, I spell it out, O-N-E, $1,000 and zero cents. Um... That's just something that I do personally. Uh, it's not anything that you have to have on your contract, but I like to make sure I leave out any, I make sure there's no questions in regards to uh, anything on the contract. Uh, next, earnest money deposit amount. How much are you securing this property for? Um, the earnest money is just a good faith amount towards the purchase price stating to the seller that I am invested into this property. So I'm going to give you some money up front to hold the property. This can be $10, it could be $100, it could be $500, you know, it could be $1,000. Uh, it could be any amount, uh, but you need to make sure you have some earnest money deposit up. And the reason why I say that is because this, the earnest money, again, is legal tender, is legal consideration towards this agreement. So if you don't put up any earnest money, um, somebody else can come behind you and get this property under contract. So, I mean, for a while, I was doing it. If the seller didn't require any earnest money, I wouldn't put any earnest money up. I want to have the least amount of money or the least amount of skin in the game, you know, to, to minimize risk. But, you know, somebody can always come behind you and secure this property if you don't have any, any EMD. So even if it's $10, $100, you know, make sure you have some kind of legal tender uh, involved. Also, the earnest money doesn't have to be money. It can be any consideration. So if you're an electrician and you make an agreement with the seller, hey, I will, you know, put in three new ceiling fans in your new home that totals, you know, $600. You can write that in the contract as your earnest money deposit. 
that is legal tender. It's legal consideration. So keep that in mind as well. We've done before that the property, the owner didn't want to clean out the property or anything like that. So our um, earnest deposit was we would pay for the cleaning out of the property and secure the dumpster and everything like that. And because we were furnishing those services, we used that as the earnest deposit amount. So it can be service, it can be money, um, but it has to be some kind of consideration. Next is the inspection period. I get a lot of questions about the inspection period. Uh, why do you need an inspection period? What's the purpose of the inspection period? Is the inspection period for you to have an inspector to come out and inspect the house? No, the importance of this inspection period is because by law, if this inspection, if you're within this inspection period, you can back out of this contract. Not to say that's what you want to do, but you want to make sure you're basically hedging your bet against your earnest money deposit. So you want to make sure, so in the event you can't find a buyer for the property, you can, you can get out of this contract. Normally, um, people do 10-day inspection periods, 14-day um, inspection periods. Uh, it doesn't matter. You just need to make sure you get yourself enough time to have your buyer come through the property. And the way we always frame this, this um, statement with the seller is we state, you know, we're putting an inspection period in play. That way we can make sure we know exactly what we're buying. We want to make sure um, the plumbing is good, the electrical is good, everything like that. So during this 10 to 14 days, we're going to have some contractors come by and take a look at the property and make sure everything is okay. These people will be contractors, um, but they'll be contractors slash buyers um, because a lot of the buyers do some of the own, their own work. They are contractors. So it's, it's a play on words, but it's not anything that questions the integrity of the process. So you want to make sure you have this inspection period in play. If, for it, if by any chance you're outside of your inspection period, and you say, ah, I don't want to close on this property, you will lose this earnest money. You will lose this earnest money deposit. So that is the purpose of this inspection period is to make sure you're securing your earnest money deposit uh, against being um, forfeited. So again, your earnest, your inspection period is for you and your buyers to view the property um, make sure that they view the property within the time frame of this inspection period. If not, you'll lose your earnest money deposit. I had that happen to me. Um, wasn't very astute on the date that this inspection period was up and lost $5,000 because I thought the inspection period was on one day. However, it was on the day before. And that seller... Uh, kept that in that earnest money deposit. So it was $5,000 lost um, because of our lack of due diligence. So it happens. You definitely have to make sure you keep this inspection period in mind. Um, then next, you have to have a closing attorney or title company, escrow officer uh, on the contract. The seller wants to know who is all involved in this transaction and you need to make sure you put that down on paper so everyone will know. There will be no guessing as to what's going on with this transaction. We always add this information again so that the, sell the seller can feel settled. So we state, okay, Mr. Seller, the closing attorney or the escrow officer is Jane Doe. She'll be giving you a call within 48 hours explaining the process and the documents that you need to, to submit in order to make this transaction go through. Um, and then also we let them know that they will be sending them a receipt of the earnest money deposit uh, put up in order to secure this transaction. So you need to make sure you have 
closing attorney or a title company. In some states, they use closing attorneys. Some states, they use title companies. In some states, you have to have both. So let's keep that in mind. You have to have that closing attorney and you have to have that title company uh, on the contract. Uh, next, you need to have the closing date. When is this transaction going to be finalized? Um, so again, we have the contract wrote on one two sixteen. Um, let's let's just say hypothetically, the closing date is two two sixteen. That needs to be on a contract. But more importantly, if you're wholesaling. Um, this, there's something else, some more verbiage I'm going to tell you in additional terms and conditions that need to be added with this closing date. So make sure dates are on the contract. Uh, next, you need to have a section for additional terms and conditions. Uh, this is very important because you stated and you told the seller that you're buying the property what as is. You're paying all closing costs um, and some other things. So you need to make sure, you know, if you're taking personal property, if the refrigerator, you know, is going to convey in the transaction, you need to make sure that's in there. Anything that you're buying in this transaction need to be in this additional terms and conditions. Um, and again, something else you need to have in the additional terms and conditions that go along with the closing date is you need to state that the closing date is 2 14 16 or on or before close of escrow date. This is important because say if you find a buyer within this inspection period of time, 10 days or let's say nine days after that, so January 11th, you find a buyer and they say, hey, you know what? Can we close this transaction out early? Let's try and close on 115. As long as you have this close on or before the escrow date, then that is a possibility. But you always want to make sure you communicate this with your seller. So you need to say, hey, Mr. Seller, I know we have a closing date of 2216. We always write in the contract on or before the escrow date in the event that we want to close the property early, um, then we will contact you and say, Mr. Seller, uh, we would like to kind of speed along this process. Are you willing to close on January 15th? If they are, so be it. Fine. Contact the title company or your closing attorney. Let them know you want to close this transaction out early and then you can get it done. If the seller says, well, no, that's a little bit aggressive, we can't get it done, and that time frame, then you say, okay, we just letting you know that we do, and we are really interested in buying a property, and we wanna get this transaction done as soon as possible. Um, if January 15th does not work for you, is there another date? Can we close it the following week, which would be January 22nd, you know? So make sure you have that on or before the escrow date. <clears throat> also, in the additional terms and conditions, you want to have seller must ensure clear and marketable title. So you always want to make sure that there's no liens or anything on the property. Um, and this is going to be done by your closing attorney or your title company. They're going to go through and make sure that there are no liens and the property is free and clear of liens in order for you to receive a clear title. Um, in the event something comes up on the transcript from the title company and they have a lien from the water company that they didn't know anything about, a thousand dollar lien from the water company. Um, what you can always do, just because there's a lien on the property does not stop, cannot stop the transaction, or I, I should rather say, it does not immediately stop the transaction. You can still purchase that property uh, going forward, but we can make sure that those liens are taken off. So, for example, <clears throat> if the property have a thousand dollar 
water bill, outstanding water bill, and it's a lien on the property, you can directly have that seller out of his proceeds or her proceeds pay for that water bill. So if the contract was wrote up for $60,000, and the property is free and clear. So they, they're they netting $60,000 minus um, prorated taxes and everything like that. If this lien pops up, then you can say, hey, Mr. Seller, you know, we're not paying for any liens because in the contract, it says the seller must have clear and marketable title. So instead of your proceeds being $60,000, it'll now be $59,000. Most sellers won't balk at that because they know that the lien was created by them. So they're going to make sure they pay for the lien. And it's it's coming out of their pocket, but it's not coming out of their pocket directly because the title company or the escrow, uh, the escrow agent or the title company or the closing attorney will make sure those fees go directly to the lien holder um, before they even receive a check. So that way the proceeds will automatically be, be taken out. So just because there's a lien on the property doesn't mean you have to stop the transaction. There's workarounds. Only thing you have to do, talk to your title company, make sure you communicate with the seller and inform them what showed up on, on, the, um, on the title as far as the lien. We just closed the transaction last week um, and it was a probate deal and there was an outstanding lien of $13,000. Well, we were able to get that $13,000 lien waived. Me working along with the title company, we were able to get that, that lien waived because that Debt holder, that mortgage company went out of business during the crash. So there were some things that we had to do in order to get that taken off. But believe me that that seller was happy because that $13,000 lien was taken off. So that's $13,000 in that seller's pocket. So it's little things like that that you can help and navigate the transaction with your seller. And that way, you know, they'll be exceedingly happy that they worked with you versus someone else. Um, so again, seller needs to ensure clear and marketable title. And if any issues arise, you can definitely work with the title company to get those liens taken care of. Uh, next, you need to make sure the signature, your signature, the buyer's signature and the seller's signature is on a contract. It does not have to be notarized. Um, in most states, it don't have to be notarized. But if you desire to have it notarized, you can have it notarized. Um, but along with the signature, again, have the date of the contract next to the signatures. Uh, very important. That way we know that that contract was legally enforced and agreed upon on this date, January 2nd, 2016. Uh, finally, one big piece, and I bring this up because I had to utilize this uh, in a transaction re recently. Um, you need to get a memorandum of agreement filed with the county clerk. Uh, what this memorandum of agreement states is that you have legal interest in this property and you're in a binding contract on this property. The reason why this come up is because in competitive markets, if you offered this person $60,000 and then two days later, another wholesaler come by and offer $65,000, is this number going to be intriguing to this seller? Of course it is. It's another $5,000. Some sellers do not have the integrity to say, hey, I'm already in a contract for $60,000. I wish you would have came, you know, a few days earlier. I would have accepted at 65, but sorry, I'm in a legally binding contract. Not all sellers do that. 
Some sellers say, oh, you offer me $65,000, sign a contract, let's get it done. Well, what this memorandum of sale does, this gets filed with the county clerk. So when title company or the closing attorney pulls the record of the title, this memorandum will show up and show that this property is already in a legally binding contract. So they cannot sell this property for $65,000 without you giving approval, without you uh, making sure that your fee or consideration is taken care of. So this stops the seller and it stops other investors from coming behind you trying to um, snake the deal from you, get the deal from you. It happens in competitive markets. Um, so I'm not sure in other counties, but I know here in Maricopa County, it only costs $10 to file the memorandum. It's a small fee, 10, 20 bucks, but it is worth the security because I have seen investors lose deals because they have not filed this memorandum. Yeah, they can go back and do legal recourse after the property sold, but who wants to go through all of the legal jargon and, and lawyers and your assignment fee get wiped out and attorney fees? If you pay, pay this small fee and have this filed up front, uh, it will eliminate all of that. And also, this memorandum, it needs to be notarized. And it doesn't need to be notarized by both parties. It just needs to be notarized by one. And you, as the buyer, have this filled out, get it notarized, 20 bucks, 10 bucks, fill it with the uh, circuit clerk, the county clerk, and that way you can't lose your deal. So, again, just to reiterate, uh, you need to have the date, you need to have the seller's name, you need to have the buyer's name, property address, along with the property identification number, purchase price, earnest money deposit amount, the inspection period. Remember, this is critical, very critical. <coughs> Excuse me. The inspection period, closing attorney, title company, closing date. You need to have the additional terms and conditions section with all of your additional terms here whatever the terms may be, whatever you guys agree upon, signature and file the memorandum. Also, we also like to ask while we're doing the contract, access <coughs> and possession. Especially during this inspection period, you wanna make sure you have access to the property. If the property is vacant or something like that, you ask can you put a lockbox on it. Some sellers are not comfortable with you having a lockbox on the property until the property is closed. So what you can always do is say, hey, you know what? I'm going to be having plumbers, carpenters, all of our trades coming through the property. How can we gain access for them to do their inspection? And a lot of them are very forthcoming and say, hey, you know what? Just give me a call. I can meet you over there. Or the neighbor has a key, um, something like that. So always make sure you have access because this gives your buyers an opportunity to come through and view the property and make you an offer on that property. Also, possession. You never want to get into a post-possession situation. Post-possession <coughs> is basically after you close the transaction, somebody is still living in the house <coughs> or somebody still have artifacts in the house. Uh, one thing that I didn't state, but we always like to do is add this verbiage also, and it's all contents. I'll just put all contents. Remaining in the property after close of escrow is the responsibility of the buyers. So once this transaction closed, anything left in the house immediately becomes the buyer's. And the reason why you want to have that is for possession purposes. You know, some people, they, they'll leave clothes, they'll leave, you know, something that they deem important 
And if you remove those contents or remove those articles and you don't have this verbiage in that contract, they can tie this property up, you know, and you want to make sure no one is living in the property uh, after close, unless, you know, that's agreed upon in the contract. So if you're a buy and hold investor and there's tenants in the property and you agree, you know, to take over that lease, then you can definitely do that. Uh, another thing that we like to make sure is on the contract in the additional terms and conditions, which I didn't write up here is if there is tenants in the property and you want the property to be free, you know, of the tenants, you can offer, you know, a cash for keys agreement. And this is basically offering money to the tenants to vacate the property. Again, needs to be in a contract, needs to be stated. Um, if it's not in the contract, it didn't happen. If it's not in the contract. So also, um, for lease, when you're purchasing a property and you're wholesaling it and it have tenants, you need to make sure you get this lease agreement from the seller. So we always write in additional terms and conditions <clears throat> that the seller provide us with the lease for review during this inspection period. That way, uh, we know exactly how long the tenants have in place with their con with their lease agreement and contract. And then again, I just want to reiterate cash for keys. If you want to buy this property and the tenants still have a long lease, let's say if they still have nine months left on their lease, you can offer them cash for keys. You can basically say, hey, I'll pay your moving expense you know, to find a new place. We're buying this property and we want it vacant. So you can offer them, I don't know, $2,000, $2,500, you know, something like that in order to make sure the property is vacant. Um, so again, <clears throat> these are some of the core things you need to make sure you have in your real estate wholesale contract. Um, you need to make sure you have all of this information. If you have any questions, leave me a comment below. If you like this, make sure you subscribe and like this you like this channel. Um, again, this is the wholesale contract. We'll be going over the assignment agreement in another video. This is Marcus Maloney again, the Equity King. If you have any questions, leave comments below. You can find us at equityrealestateblog.com if you want a copy of a contract. Um, that way you can submit it to your attorney to have it reviewed. So again, Marcus Maloney, equityrealestateblog.com. Yes, I buy houses, Phoenix.